Thanks for showing up to my talk. It's fantastic to see you all here. I'm really happy to um, be at MoneroCon again. Um, you can download the slides because I put a lot of uh, links and things into, into the research into the slides, so I made them available for you to download. Um, so if you want to follow the things later on, there's, um, everything is validated. And this will make a lot of sense when, I'm, um, uh, when you will see uh, what I'm pointing to in my talk. So it has a bit, uh, a bit of a random uh, a title, but you will understand uh, in a few minutes why uh, it's important to nurture decentralization and why uh, we have to nurture decentralization in the age of the digital commons. So um, I want to quickly start before I jump into the talk um, to introduce myself. Um, my name is Matthias Tarasiewicz. I'm working in open source and in technology since um, quite some time now. Uh, I'm also one of the founders of the Riot Institute. We essentially work, uh, it's an NGO. We work um, with open source and free software and with all things open and, and free. And we publish and research and we foster also um, uh, supporting people and projects um, for quite some time. So the whole institution is existing for um, already, um, if we count like um, before it was called Riot, almost 20 years, which is quite some time in my opinion. We have a lot of publications also. Um, we especially made a few of those available for you. So essentially if you go to um, riot.at slash publication underscore pack, you can, we made available all the publications we um, did so far, which is a lot of books and things as well. And uh, my colleagues have also uh, brought some of the print material with them. So if you want to have them just approach us after the talk, then we can very happily give you some of our books that we brought with us. Uh, we are also part um, of the Decentral Community, which is a institutional, like I would say, like a meta organization existing since um, a few years. We are always um, in the context of the Chaos Communication Congress, which is an annual hacker congress, hacker meeting in, in Germany. It's a very large one. Uh, organizing together with the Monero community, what we call the Critical Decentralization Cluster. It's a cluster of different uh, like-minded projects and people mostly in the domain of privacy and um, uh, open source and we are uh, producing program. If you want to see what we are doing, you can follow our work on decentral.community or you can also join us on Matrix or um, also watch the, the talks from the past years. It's, most of it is online. Um, but to get into the, into the weeds, into the actual talk here, um, I structured this into four parts and um, I want to be talking about um, decay of technological projects and platforms. And also I want to thematize how open source shows some kind of decay. Over time with decay, I mean um, it's actually transforming to something else. I'm not entirely sure if we know what it is yet, but it's definitely not the same open culture that we've seen um, a few years ago. And um, I want to be making a case for verifiable things, verifiable hardware, verifiable software, everything, all things verifiable, because I think that's what we as cypherpunks need to be looking for. Everything that's not verifiable is not trustworthy, so why to bother with it? And um, as a conclusion, I want to also point out a few things, how to, a few suggestions actually, what I think we can use to nurture decentralization further. So um, to jump into the part one of that, um, I want to be um, talking about this quote from Corey Doktorov, or maybe some of you know the term, and shitification, which was all over the web. It's like a heavily debated and heavily used term uh, these days. And, and shitification essentially tells a story and shows and explains to us how digital systems decay over time. And Corey Doktorov is actually pointing it down to this kind of cycle of shitification, um, how he calls it, which is actually four phases in which projects, products, any sort of system gets actually um, slowly worse and exploits the users. He's pointing this out with all sorts of um, systems we have these days on the example of YouTube, uh, Twitch, all sorts of um, um, systems you can think of. Um, I'm thinking that we can actually maybe extend this to other cultures and to other things as well because um, I feel like there's this decay that we can observe. And I want to make the point that um, this inshidification and um, it's, um, if you Google that, it's like a complete um, um, insanity going on. So a lot of people are discussing it. It's, like a, it's really an online term that um, you should be aware of. Because I feel like um, it's interesting to me. Um, I feel like I've heard that before. There's like definitely different um, examples from the past, from history, where we see um, other ways of how to that explain to me and to exp explain to us how things decay over time, especially technological systems, innovation, and so on. So one of those examples um, has been already outlined by Jonathan Citrain in his book, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. It's a great book. If you don't know it, read it. It's freely available. 
um, Citroen is making the point that um, we are getting used to all sorts of like um, changes in, in, in systems, in technology around us, and um, it usually gets introduced um, um, very um, slowly with um, small um, tethers, so combinations to other systems and other perks that then tether you to an entire ecosystem. He's making the point uh, on the case of the, of the Apple App Store, and he's also making a specific point, and bear in mind this is from 2008, so um, he explains that, for example, Apple um, created the iPhone um, as the first phone at this time where you could not use a like users could not replace the battery anymore. And we got so used to it and now we're not even questioning why we can't change the battery anymore. But this slow decay of, of, of um, things and of small things, small technologies is everywhere. And this is one example where we find this as well. Another example is also um, some seminal text by Anderson and Wolf um, in Wired magazine um, where they were making the case that the web is like um, over. This was actually 2010. And they're making the case for um, the internet. So what we see here very nicely is like um, there is this um, change of the protocols in use, and we see like how different media is suddenly used. Um, so there's like um, as you see on the on the graph also a lot more media used. Um, um, text becomes like is like changing. It's getting commodified. The whole web is changing. And so there's all these kind of different uh, pointers where we see how things got enshidified already uh, in different parts, um, different theories. Of the, of the past century. But also, um, there's um, a lot of like crit critique on um, the term enshidification, on how Cory Doctorow sees this. There is even a um, text about the enshidification of enshidification, like every, everything goes to shit is, is the TLDR here. Um, but um, there's a few very nice approaches as well, and a few really um, profound um, critique points, which I don't want to dive into now, but you can definitely take a look. It's really, it's really worth it. Um, I think we can look at other systems as well and think of if they are facing some kind of enshidification. So um, they are changing, they are not doing what they're supposed to do, they're like a little bit um, becoming something else. And um, for me, I was asking myself the question, like, is really is Bitcoin maybe enshidifying? Is it enshidified? What, what, what's happening with Bitcoin? Um, looking at the original white paper of Satoshi and looking at Bitcoin now, we see that this is a very different thing now in my opinion. Like, um, there was, um, at the time of Bitcoin, um, we had a big problem, which still doesn't seem to be solved to me, which is micropayments. So I want to be able to pay for something online and not have an intermediary. Um, this is actually not solved by Bitcoin. It's solved by Monero. So why is this uh, actually something that um, uh, Bitcoin is supposed to solve? So I see, like, um, and I want to make the point here that um, it's maybe not really enshidified yet, but it's definitely changing. So Bitcoin is not the same as what it was um, um, intended to be in the beginning. And we see this also with um, uh, the example of the micropayments, but maybe on some other ends as well. Some people might even go so far as to say that Bitcoin is um, really um, not um, that great and might provide um, all of the tools to fuck you. Um, I think that's to some extent true, um, but also I want to point here um, out, so Arctic Mine was making the the, um, the good point yesterday um, that uh, maybe we're just using this wrong. Maybe we should keep our uh, public keys also uh, private and not hand them out everywhere, and then maybe it wouldn't be such a privacy nightmare. So I think that's definitely true. And while um, I think like we should um, think about um, what a specific technology offers to us, that um, in the end, maybe it's a fundamental thing that is part of the technology itself that it has to change. Maybe it's something cannot stay the same or cannot stay the same as it was um, postulated at the beginning. Um, looking at different examples of history, we see also that this has been thematized over and over. So the whole term and shittification and the whole um, decay of technology is nothing really super new. So here, um, most um, famously, Joseph Schumpeter was um, actually explaining um, how in the innovation cycle, systems have to have this kind of honeymoon phase in the beginning and um, um, that um, there is actually um, a new system that creates always this kind of um, um, uh, challenging um, factor, but um, eventually they have to also um, move away from their original goals and values as soon as they reach this position. And this is actually also available in a lot of other theories. So uh, another example where we could argue that Bitcoin is enshidified already is the iron law of oligarchy, which was um, comes from sociology and is um, um, pointing out that any system, um, however democratic it might start um, in the beginning, tends to become an oligarchy over time. So um, on the case of Bitcoin, we can actually um, 
talk about decentralization and centralization and, and observe how specific centralization factors are appearing in Bitcoin. Another um, good example from a more recent time um, is the institutional isomorphism, which essentially um, says that all institutions over time um, somehow behave the same, appear the same. So that's also interesting to me, so that um, introduces the, the problem that over time we have to think about like what kind of time factor we're looking at here and um, how are these, um, these systems, how are these um, different technological systems um, even distinguish from each other. So I think this is a good point because we can actually also observe this with like um, a lot of like different shit coins out there. They're, they tend to solve the same problems, or at least they're claiming to solve the same problems. So I think this is not um, maybe um, a cryptocurrency only thing here, but this is a, here um, from a systemic view, definitely an organizational uh, form that, that, that um, tends to be the same over time. So um, somehow relating this to theory, we can also um, think about how to escape this enshittification, how to get out of this vicious cycle, how can this actually change? Um, and um, maybe this is uh, well known, this um, publication, not sure if you're aware, if not, uh, read it. It's a very good book that is often cited. Um, it's called Exit, Voice and Loyalty from um, Albert um, Hirschman. Um, Hirschman was presenting, essentially, if you're not aware um, about the theory, um, in the 70s on what are the other fundamental principles of decision that a user has or a customer has towards a service or product. So they can either um, exit not criticizing anything, just stop using it, or they can uh, voice, so they can try to change it, they can voice the concern, they can try to somehow change the product, or um, they don't care because they are, um, they are for example, skin in the game, or they, are, they don't wanna uh, deal with it. They can stay loyal, but not do anything, so it's like the non-participation um, route. I think that's interesting, and I think um, with this uh, framework, we can actually observe a lot of the um, systems out there, and we can also maybe draw conclusions um, to Monero. I think um, these are like, um, this is a very good framework also to understand like um, how we can conquer enshittification, how we can actually make sure and observe if a system is enshittified and how we can potentially, um, what kind of options we have if we can identify enshittification. The question um, remains if we can actually change something. So often in centralized systems, in specific systems that are out there, maybe in Bitcoin, maybe we are not uh, in the, position to change something, because maybe we are not in the, in the core team, maybe we are not in a specific team that can decide something. So the problem is always like also then um, a question of, of influence and a question of uh, who you know. So it becomes maybe this kind of oligarchic uh, problem that I discussed before. So um, while we can maybe conclude that um, enshittification is a thing that happens to all systems, especially if money is involved, um, fully decentralized systems um, are not that easy and shittifiable, if that's a word. Um, and um, I think Monero is a good example because I think it's like pretty tough to, to and shittify Monero fully because it's like very decentralized, there's a lot of um, stakeholders there. Uh, and definitely it's also not uh, purely financial gains at the core of it. That's maybe, I'm not sure if that's true, but let's, let's hope. So um, um, this type of de degradation might be a thing that um, hopefully changes things for the better, but I think, um, and I hope um, I explained to you the core principles of enshittification, because you need this kind of piece of information to, to, to take it to the second step of, uh, of my presentation, which is um, as I'm trying to argue why open source is enshittified. Um, and maybe, and I hope you're still following <laughs> the enshittification thing, it's, it's for me also, I'm not a native speaker, a bit tough to say enshittification, 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 should have tested this better. Um, so I want to argue that open source is enshittified. And it is because um, I was res I'm researching this for quite some time, so um, I looked at a lot of um, licenses. I was p running a few um, smaller open source projects. I was helping out. So I'm like very active in the, in the culture. And to me personally, it feels like a lot is changing. It feels like not the same anymore. People are stopping to care, um, open source isn't, feels not so strong anymore. I thought like, okay, maybe this is just an age thing, I don't know. So I was talking to a lot of um, uh, people that I know and I was trying to figure out if this is really just me like observing this, but I felt like a bit of a, um, 
um, the, the sentiment has changed in open source. And I want to actually, to make my point of why I think open source is in Shittified, make a distinction between open source and public source. So um, there is definitely um, something which is open source minus the community, which is called public source. This was at least um, suggested by a researcher that um, there should be a distinction uh, um, done like that. I'm not sure if that's an official um, um, classification, but public source is open source minus the community. And if you think about it, there's a lot of um, repos, a lot of projects out there that are really doing that. So you cannot really participate. It's kind of theoretically open source. You're supposed to be able to do something, but you can't. A very good example is the Android operating system. You could maybe upstream something, maybe if you know someone, but do you know anyone who ever could upstream something there? Uh, another good example is um, everything that's under the Apple public um, public source license. I, I think these projects are really dead. They are like enshittified. But if you want the stamp of enshittification, I think that's the Apple uh, uh, public source license. It's really it's really bad. You, you can you can do your own research if you don't believe me. But it's really it's really a joke. So um, I want to make the case for why open source is enshittified by um, taking this quote from uh, a venture capitalist who was saying most famously in 2011, I believe. Software is eating the world. And um, while software is eating the world, um, it doesn't really look like um, people are, that are writing those so software pieces and the software maintaining this software are having such a good time. I'm not sure if you know um, this joke. This is an XKCD um, joke about um, a person thanklessly um, maintaining a software project in Nebraska. Um, it became like the, the meme, like the person in Nebraska it can be somewhere else. It could be anywhere in the world, but in this case, Nebraska was was picked. And um, it's actually the the joke. Everyone knows the joke. Um, I don't find it so funny, although I was laughing in the beginning. But if you think more about it, it's like a lot of people thanklessly support open source, maintain open source. And um, I think the case for open source being shittified is even made stronger if you think about like what's happening to open source as a culture, because in a way. Um, most of the people see open source as everything that's on GitHub. And that's a bit of a limiting way of how to see um, the whole open source scene. But this is how it's, how it's um, seen by a lot of people, especially people who are not that deep in open source. And um, the problem is that this um, thanklessly maintained software um, out of Nebraska and anywhere else in the world actually faces a lot of problems because we've seen this just recently. The, um, um, there was a huge exploit in a compression um, software that was luckily found in the last minute. So um, there was a, a really, really long attack, like over a few years, people got access to the um, XZ compression software. And um, this could only be pulled off because there was, um, the people were really burned out. The people wanted to pass on a few tasks of the system, but it was really, it was really not uh, smart what they did. There were a few choices that were maybe um, um, could have been managed better, but then at the same time, it's like two people that were managing this. So it's like really astonishing to me how much of our critical infrastructure of the world is running, being maintained by a few people. So if you look at um, OpenSSH, um, so a, a, a few of the like cryptographic tools of the world are run by a few people that are um, like maybe not earning enough than, than being burned out. This is not smart. We have to really do something about this. And um, I think um, this is only one side of the coin of why open source is enshittified. So it's not about uh, only the maintenance of the software, but I think there's also structural change um, that we see. So um, I found this really nice um, debate and discussion also from uh, Murphy, um, a young researcher that is pointing out that um, we have also an incentive problem generally in, in, in developing software. So young people, um, young developers, um, would not um, very likely start to develop in open source because there's a lot of other incentives that you have. For example, um, writing and deploying software on Google Play Store, on Apple App Store or so, you can much quicker make a living out of that. And that's actually, as a narrative, much stronger than uh, thanklessly maintaining software from Nebraska. So I think we can do a lot um, um, in that by changing also our narratives about that or by thinking like how we can support open source better. Because the problem, I think, is if we don't think about this as a community, as a culture, um, Microsoft will. Because there's already um, in, on GitHub this kind of um, donation program. And this is all bad. This is t tethering the developers to one organization. It's not good. It's like a giving too much control to a single entity. So um, 
there is this um, other response to the term um, uh, that um, software is eating the world, which is open source is eating software faster than software is eating the world, which I was actually not sure if that's true, but I checked it, and it's actually um, shocking how much open source software we have already. And um, I mean, I'm a big open source enthusiast, but um, I think there is like something we have to also look at here, which is like uh, there's a lot of different um, software licenses in place, and lot all of them are like really great for for us as a society. Um, I wanna um, here not go into extreme detail about the different licenses. I think um, um, John Murphy was giving a very great talk yesterday also about like um, understanding like the different um, the different uh, licensing models and how Monero does fit into that. So that's you should really watch that. That was really great. So I'm not going into these details. There's a few other people that are writing a lot about um, about that topic as well. So um, I can recommend Dev Lawyer, uh, who has a great blog and explaining like really in detail on how the different uh, licenses are affecting specific implementations and um, are actually relevant for you as a developer or as a user. But um, if we look at um, open source and we are try to understand like what is out there, what is used, what 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 is the open source culture as a whole? Um, the interesting thing um, is that um, it's mostly permissive licenses. And so um, if you look at data, I mean, there's like a lot of data sources you can actually take. So there's like um, a lot of data from um, different archives. There's not only um, GitHub, there's also, but this is the data from GitHub, for example. So you see also that the top license um, is MIT. You have a lot of other, Apache 2 and then GPL3. And this is also changing over, over the years. It's not very visible here, but you can maybe later look this up on the slide. Um, the problem is also looking at GitHub alone shows us that, that there's a lot of like, um, lot of um, stuff that is um, not having a license or has the default checkbox. And this is also relevant because GitHub changed the default checkbox value a few years ago. So who knows if the people really care about what they're clicking here. So I'm not sure if we can actually um, use the GitHub um, um, sources as, a, as an interesting data source. There's still a lot um, of other interesting sources we can um, take a look um, at. For example, here, this is actually the software conservancy. So there's like a lot of other places which always like show um, that um, the main um, licenses used are mainly MIT and maybe per mainly permissive licenses. So the copyleft licenses are in the minority everywhere. And I think um, I would actually extend the, all the uh, discussed um, uh, kind of citations before and to, uh, these um, sentences to the uh, permissive open source licenses are eating the commons faster than software is eating the world. Because um, we have um, actually open source culture and the whole open source um, uh, culture being a permissive license culture, which is doesn't sound bad, but I argue that from a um, cypherpunk perspective, we want more open licenses because we want to validate things. We want to actually validate the software we're running. We want to ideally validate the hardware we're running because otherwise, how can you trust this? You introduce trust through permissive licenses because people can actually close um, down the, the code again, release this, um, you, don't, you cannot verify it in the worst case. I'm not saying this is always the case, but in the worst case, you cannot verify that. So you're introducing trust into the whole system. So um, we want those open source systems though because we want to be able to verify them. So um, also Monero is under permissive license. Um, I don't think that this is a big problem from a licensing uh, apart from Monero, but we've seen what kind of issues this introduces. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm a big fan of these forks. I guess nobody is. But there is like um, all these kind of forks coming up. Um, there is definitely um, more to Monero than just the code. It's definitely the network. It's the, uh, it's the community. Um, but um, it was also discussed um, several times on different uh, from different angles, um, what about the licensing debate? Um, it's a huge discussion also on the on different CCS project on uh, what kind of license should be used. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm unhappy with what Monero does at the moment. I'm just saying, think about it, read what those licenses do and what you're able to do with them because they matter and they are like really uh, important to understand to understand what you're doing with, uh, with your software and what you are able to do with your software. So um, as I said before, I want to actually make the case that we should be able to verify everything because I feel like uh, in the context of, of Cypherpunk, in the context of Monero, we should um, try and verify more than we would usually because we want to be able to also um, have a high level of privacy, high level of anonymity, and we want to be able to, to have uh, verifiable systems, not only to understand them, but also to, to have a high security um, aspect. 
so uh, in this context, I already gave a talk on exactly this stage a few years ago. Um, if you want to uh, look at this, then uh, I would be happy. So this one is, um, was about um, open and libre hardware and how we can actually create verifiable hardware. I just want to quickly talk um, about a few things in this context of this talk. So um, if we talk about um, free, open, public, um, um, libre things, um, usually a very easy way to categorize them would be to say, okay, there's like software, there's content, there's data, there's hardware. The problem is um, with hardware, and this was um, what I outlined in the, in, the, in the talk that I linked, it's an entirely different beast because we will not be able to verify hardware so easily. Um, the problem essentially is that most systems, if we're talking, if we're just taking the software and just taking the hardware part, um, are black boxes. We cannot really test them. There's no way for us to verify them. There is um, maybe specific um, workarounds in that, but especially in hardware, we have a really, really hard time in doing that. Um, another um, point I want to actually make is that um, it's not enough to just look at, okay, what's open? Just open sounds good, and so I'm, I'm like keeping this because I can verify it. It's actually a very, very commodified term, and we have been writing a whole book about this. The problem is, um, take open AI. What is open about this? It doesn't make any sense to me. So like um, the whole term open and a lot of all the other terms already got in shittified. So we have to be aware that we cannot use any of these terminologies. We cannot use this. We cannot um, even rely on anything like that. So even open standards, if we don't verify, means nothing. So don't just look at what these things are. Try to verify them. Try to disassemble them. And um, this is also a point that Bunny Wang uh, is uh, making. So it's a really fantastic um, talk he has been giving at 363, which was, was called Open Source is Insufficient to Solve Trust Problems in Hardware. So what his point essentially is, and um, um, maybe you know um, Bunny, he was actually um, reverse engineering and hacking the Xbox and so on. He's a very famous, he's a very famous um, hardware hacker. And he's making everything that he does available. So he created also an open source um, notebook, um, lots of things. Um, the thing is, like, this guy is really very, very knowledgeable and um, is working over 10 years already on different approaches on how to verify hardware. It's just not possible because um, microcomputers, um, uh, microchips, microcontrollers, um, hardware in general is, is so tiny and is really not possible to really um, made, be made verifiable. Um, there is also a few uh, elements which are, could, uh, could already um, be in, um, implemented into, into hardware and you would not be even able to detect them, um, such as stealthy uh, dopant level hardware trojans. There is a paper from 2013 which is thematizing this. Um, although nobody has spotted this because it's really hard to spot, um, the theory is really solid and um, um, there's also um, examples of how this could actually um, easily bit flip or um, so on. So what Bunny came up with as a solution is he creates like custom hardware that is um, obfuscated so the, um, so you cannot do geographic attacks on the actual hardware. But that you can only do if you design the hardware yourself and if you're able to use this, uh, this hardware yourself, which is actually tough if you want to use um, standard encryption or like fast encryption, anything that's recent. So essentially, um, for those people who are um, really, really interested in making um, sure that they are using verifiable systems, they are stuck with old hardware. They are stuck with systems they can reverse engineer, systems where they can maybe um, access and change the bootloaders, the firmware, and so on. This is a pretty tough thing. So I think like all of these things are getting shittified. So hardware got shittified, software got shittified. Essentially, cypherpunk culture got shittified. Everything seems to be going to shit. But I, I think um, there's still a way for us how to verify uh, those things. So we have to at least try. Um, it's tough with modern hardware, but um, I think um, a bigger problem at the moment are mobile phones, for example. So I want to point to the Replicant project, which in my opinion does a really fantastic job also in explaining the problem. So we have um, with phones the problem that a lot of the uh, modems are not really usable from a Libre perspective because they are containing binary blobs. So you have to trust um, the providers of those drivers that um, they are not doing any shenanigans or not phoning home. So that's, that's a big limitation. So it's such a tiny fraction of hardware we're really able to use to verifiably and, and provably do some cryptographic um, shenanigans we want to do as cypherpunks. And that's, that's sad. I think we should try and really uh, unshittify this kind of situation, if that's a word. Um, so Bunny's approach is to create things that can be visually inspected. But I don't think that that's really a feasible track that we can do as, as, as cypherpunks because a lot of things um, are too tiny. So 
microcomputers are by definition micro, and so we cannot really use the inspection. Although he has a few examples of how we could do that, um, I would say the problem is um, we have to thematize this and think about this hard because also free and, um, and av available um, technologies such as RISC-V are not solving the situation. So there's a huge, of, a huge proprietary uh, portion in the whole uh, RISC-V um, um, manufactured um, chips as well that people are not talking about. So while the instruction set is open, the chips themselves are not um, open. So there's a lot of things and everything seems to be getting unshittified. So I think um, we have to, if we cycle back to Monero, also think about what can we do in this kind of unshittified situation? Can we maybe do some kind of decentralized verification? Can we do something that um, utilizes this great community we have? Can we do something um, that, that helps um, in actually making this possible without having to inspect all the hardware we have and without like observing the supply chain and everything. And I think um, there definitely is a few ways of how we can do that. And um, this is my conclusion. So I think, um, I hope I could actually show you that platforms and products decay over time. I'm sure there are like more examples like that and there is like more you can read online about how things get in shittified. Um, but um, I think the problem that we are facing in this um, is more, um, as we are also shaping the te technology around us, that um, we have to start um, reinvestigating the technologies we're looking at. So we have to constantly revalidate them and understand and check, okay, is this still what we wanted? Is this still what we signed up for? On the example of Bitcoin, on the example of Monero, on the example of all the things, all the technologies around us, so that this kind of slow decay cannot happen. Um, and I think, I hopefully made the point um, good that open source is enshittified as well. We cannot use the term open to signify anything because it's a completely shit term that is just a marketing speak and doesn't mean anything these days. So um, we should aim for verifiable things. So we should try to verify things. We should be able to reproduce, verify, and make sure that we uh, are using uh, verifiable computing, verifiable devices, all sorts of things verifiable. And I think the only way of how we can do that is by gaining more technological literacy. So the products around us, technologies around us are trying to get us, a, like, like trying to ab abstract a lot of layers away from us, such as hardware, such as like the, the hard parts, the cryptographic parts. Um, I think that's important to not do that and really look at the things that we can actually uh, learn try to understand most of it and try to ask, uh, like, and this is something we can do as a community, and I'm really happy that Monero is doing exactly that. Um, so that means we have to think about um, de device drivers, we have to think about binary blocks, we have to think about hardware and um, the freedom of hardware, but we also have to think about um, what um, and how these things come to be. It's like, usually it's not impossible to understand these things, but we have to also um, stop using these proprietary devices, stop using these, these um, devices that are not uh, following um, our standards. And another very simple example, um, and I love this example, and I love this about the Monero community, um, as I was also actively taking part at this, is the, um, was the Monero run. I'm not sure if you uh, remember this, so two years ago, um, this was a decentralized action of the Monero community to validate and to verify what centralized exchanges um, do with their Monero reserves. And um, if you remember, so a lot of people, so the theory behind it is um, you want to move your Monero anyway off your centralized exchanges because that's what's the reasonable choice. But then um, what is also interesting is that most of the, um, or the theory at least said, most of the centralized exchanges don't hold even the right amount of Monero in the, on their books. They don't have to show it, so they don't care. So they will exchange only if you, if you move stuff off of the, of the exchanges. And... Um, Interestingly, on the same day when this was happening and when the um, decentralized Monero was happening, a lot of the, of the um, exchanges um, were facing issues with their wallets. So that was really interesting and created a decentralized way of how and or, or rank list of the best exchanges, centralized exchanges that are using Monero. So these kind of things, these kind of community action, decentralized action is something we can do as a community very easily. It gets harder, of course, with hardware. It gets a bit harder with specific implementations of software, but this is definitely something we should, should go for. Decentralized verification community action. Yeah, so this is my last slide, and I hope I could explain you um, um, the context um, of commons and like how we want to have um, validatable things. And I want to leave you with this, with this quote from the Decentral community from 2019, with it, which is that decentralization is a process and has to be constantly challenged. Thank you very much. <laughs>